around the world. Welcome to this future session on unpacking infrastructure resilience through lexicon principles and standards. When we communicate with each other, we may use similar words, but may have a completely different understanding. For example, think about nature based solutions. A hydraulic engineer might think about it as something which will improve his or her engineering design. Someone else might think of it as clean, sustainable cities. We are here to explore a shared language for the disaster resilience of infrastructure. Co-organized with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, this session will focus on disaster resilience infrastructure lexicon, an initiative of CDRI, and global principles for resilient infrastructure an initiative by the UNDRR. It is my privilege to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Mona Anand. Dr. Mona Anand is the Director for Research and Knowledge Management at the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Trained as an architect and development planner, she has been involved in research, knowledge initiatives, policy development, and practice of safe and sustainable habitats in South Asia. Over to you, Dr. Mona. Thank you, Him. Thank you, Him. Greetings, everyone. Um, it's such an honor to be moderating this session today uh, with such a stellar group of panelists who will collectively nuance uh, the whole idea of shared understanding of what we know as disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, with me in the studio is Dr. Susan Roth from the ADB. I will be introducing her in more detail as we move forward. Others who are joining us uh, as part of the panel today are Dr. Cassidy Johnson, and these are our colleagues who are joining virtually. Dr. Cassidy from the U uh, University College London in the UK, uh, Mr. Abhilash Panda from the UNDRR, Ms. Shiva Makotoko, uh, Director and Deputy CEO, RBN uh, Fund, Fund Managers, Mr. Nestor Alfonso Santa Maria from the OECD. I warmly welcome all our colleagues and panelists uh, uh, for this session today. Small housekeeping reminder for our audience who've joined uh, virtually, the ones who are here physically may raise their hand if there is uh, something that they want to uh, query about or add. And those who are joining virtually, please do drop in your messages and questions in the chat box. We'd be happy to take them up towards the end of the session. Now, as a prelude to what we're going to discuss today, uh, let me remind you of a story. It's a very popular Indian story of the elephant and the seven blind men. Mm -hmm. We have a small illustration that uh, may uh, come handy here. Anyone heard the story, uh, elephant and the seven blind men? Just one hand up. So I'll take a minute to share the story with you. So there was seven bl blind men were asked to describe an elephant the way they could experience the animal. So the person who was touching the trunk thought it was a snake that the person was touching. Uh, the person who was touching the legs thought it was a tree. Likewise, the person touching the tail thought it was a rope that was given to the person. So when these seven men tried to look at the same animal, their perspectives, their understanding was so different. And we are no different. You know, we are blinded by our own disciplines, our own mandates, our own, uh, uh, you know, places we come from in life uh, as professionals. So we, we need to really get rid of those blindfolds and develop a common vocabulary uh, as co-travelers in this journey on DRI. And this is what this session is all about. Um, to take the session forward, I now invite Dr. Cassidy Johnson to present the ongoing work of CDRI and its uh, partners on developing a lexicon for disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, Dr. Cassidy is a professor of urbanism and disaster risk reduction at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit in the UCL uh, in London. In true spirit of partnership, we have requested Cassidy to present the Lexicon project at this session. Cassidy, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Mona, and um, it's a great pleasure to. Can't hear you. Could you please unmute? Is there an issue with the audio? Uh, I'm not muted. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was worried there for a moment. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Mona. I'm, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, so I've been, or just, we are, we are beginning work on, on uh, a lexicon with CDRI and I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, project with them. If you could just go forward to the next slide, please. Yeah, so what we've, what we've found in, uh, in, in looking at this issue is that with, in terms of um, all of the partners that work with CDRI, um, there's a need for facilitating this effective communication uh, across disciplines, organizations, specialists and non-specialists who are working uh, in the field of disaster resilient infrastructure. And as we know, infrastructure development, uh, management um, takes, uh, planning takes a lot of different people and people coming from different countries, coming from different uh, backgrounds, uh, different disciplines, and we all need to be talking about the same thing. So the idea with this lexicon is to develop uh, a, a terminology and, and an understanding on terms that are important for people to understand. And the idea with this is to build this common vocabulary um, and to develop this an internationally recognized knowledge resource on uh, disaster resilient infrastructure and the kind of words that we might use to, to describe certain aspects of that. If we could go forward to the next slide, please. Uh, the process that uh, CDRI has laid out for this uh, is a co-creation approach. Um, so the idea is to build on the existing work of members and partners who are part of this uh, group um, and to develop a shared understanding on words and terminologies. Um, and we, uh, there's a starting point for this and many of you will recognize that there are many existing terminology documents and strategic documents such as the ISO standards. Uh, UNDRR has done a lot of work on this. The IPCC has many definitions, uh, the UNFCCC and other organizations. So we're starting with those, that basis of documents and trying to work up from those. Um, and I'm part of the core expert group uh, and there's also members, for example, from the Asian Development Bank, uh, the World Bank, European Union, uh, UNDRR, who are part of this core expert group. Uh, and we're going to be taking a look at uh, a master list of terms uh, and looking at different definitions coming from different areas, uh, different regions, um, and building this up to, to a uh, a shared document in which we can then finally uh, broadcast and disseminate. If you could just go forward to the next slide, please. So some of these key terms that we have, this is, we have a, we've started with a hundred key terms which uh, colleagues in CDRI have been uh, working on. Um, some of them listed here, for example. Uh, and these are kind of terms that people use in the field, but yet are not we often are talking about different kinds of things and I'll speak a bit more about that later in the session. Um, so when we talk about, uh, for example, climate resilient infrastructure, uh, when we talk about gender equity or indigenous knowledge, it would be very, it would be very nice to have a, an, a, uh, a common definition of these terms. For example, uh, if we talk about climate resilient infrastructure, uh, exactly which aspects of climate are we talking about? Which, what do we mean by resilience? So we need to build those into it. Um, so I'll leave it there for now and um, thank you very much. And I'll talk a little bit more about the applications of this later in the session. Thank you very much, uh, Cassidy, for your presentation. And thank you also for pointing out that this effort is really building on the existing work of CTRI members and partners and not uh, duplicating. So the idea is building synergies and, you know, scaling it out, uh, this entire effort in, in, in a large way. 
Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susan Roth to our audience. Uh, Dr. Roth is an advisor and chief of knowledge management at the Asian Development Bank. She has led the design of ADB's uh, new knowledge management action plan, which supports the implementation of the bank's strategy 2030. So Dr. Roth, let me be a bit provocative here with you. <laughs> In your experience, what are some of the challenges uh, that you may have seen in terms of understanding of resilient infrastructure? Do gaps in common understanding, uh, you know, affect our efforts? And is there any way we can bridge this uh, gap? Yeah. Well, let me take um, the knowledge management perspective and, and uh, let's generalize this a little bit. I, I think what we all see is if we want to break silos and integrate different disciplines, which we need to do, obviously, if you want to build disaster resilient infrastructure, then we have to have common understanding and common um, uh, uh, terminologies, right? Um, and uh, what we see currently is definitely uh, probably the, the understanding of the concept of disaster resilient infrastructure is still very much seen as hard infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? And probably we have to move to understanding the system of infrastructure, we have to understand the users, how we make them resilient, and also how do we make actually operating and maintenance, maintenance resilient or the response when something happens. Um, we recently had a project in one of our member countries, um, which was um, completed. Uh, but then uh, a disaster happened and the project uh, disappeared, so to say, $500 million investment. And probably one of the challenges there was that in the planning and implementation, there wasn't maybe adequate conversation about what means resilience from an infrastructure perspective to make the structure strong enough. And of course, from the um, uh, communities living around or living in the, in, uh, uh, on the uh, downstream area of this particular infrastructure. So these are good examples. Um, I think, in addition, um, building resilience is new territory for all of us, and we don't even know to what standard we will have to build resilience, right, because it's constantly changing, you have to have adaptive processes. So this is, I think, where it will be very interesting to think about how can we develop adaptive standards, and how do we adapt them to countries also. That's a very, very interesting uh... Uh, you know, unique dimension that you've brought to the conversation. So on that note, um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for that contribution. And I want to bring in uh, Mr. Abhilash Panda from the UNDRR. Um, he heads um, the International Development Humanitarian Response inve and Investment Portfolios um, at UNDRR. And as the Deputy Chief for Interagency Coordination, Intergovernmental Processes, and partnerships. He leads uh, the UNDRR's efforts in the areas of financing risk prevention, de-risking investment, and resilience of infrastructure globally. He has also led the United Nations' largest global initiative to build the resilience of more than 3,000 cities. Abhilash, we request you to share with us your ongoing work on the principles of resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Mona, for uh, for the invite, and very pleased to co-organize this session with uh, with you and other colleagues who are joining us today on this panel. I loved your opening uh, anecdote uh, story on the uh, of the elephant and the blind people, and I, I and I think we all what we are discussing here is is sort of giving or trying to address or remove those gaps and awareness and you know un uh, taking out the issues around uh, common understanding and approaches and UNDR's work in the last one year or so around this is is one of the attempts amongst others right so <clears throat> I mean just very quickly uh, UNDRR is the focal point in the United Nations system for the coordination of efforts to reduce disasters and to ensure synergies, right? For the past year, as I said, we have been developing the principles, which uh, which you will see as a part of the uh, as part of the slides that would be running in front of you now. Uh, now, these principles uh, have been developed with with the technical engagement of the University College London, but along with other member states and partners, which include CDRI. Um, with the feedback of OECD, World Bank, um, Asian Development Bank, and other UN agencies. Now, we all know that um, infrastructure um, 
critical infrastructure underpins much of our daily lives more than ever. Uh, people dependent on critical infrastructure um, that provide energy, transport, water, lit, waste, wastewater, digital communication. It's all encompassing within that. We also depend on these for essential services such as health and social care. I mean, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic is an example and is a statement to that. At the same time, evidence also shows that existing infrastructure systems are increasingly affected by natural and man-made hazards and by the impacts of climate change. Um, my colleague from ADB just mentioned an uh, example, and we have seen uh, multiple examples of that of some similar natures in the last few years. Now, the principles for resilient infrastructure are being developed to do a few specific things. One is to assist in raising awareness and setting a common basic understanding of what resilient infrastructure constitutes, form the basis for planning and implementation of infrastructure projects that take resilience as a core value, to communicate the desired outcomes of national infrastructure systems to establish resilience of critical services, and to assist the public and private sector in making risk informed policy and investment decisions. Next slide, please. Now the principles uh, for resilient infrastructure, that's what we call it. We don't call it the PRI intentionally. There is, there is another, uh, another initiative globally called the PRI. So this always is an explicit reading, the principles for resilient infrastructure. This, uh, this brings the ambitions of the sustainable development goals, in particular, the SDG nine, and the Sendai framework together, in particular, the global target D uh, of Sendai framework, which calls for substantially reducing disaster damage to critical infrastructure and the reduction of uh, to disruption of basic services. Furthermore, um, resilient infrastructure is also a prerequisite for achieving a host of other global agreements. I mean, if you look at the Paris Agreement, the new urban agenda, the um, Addis Ababa action agenda, including the interagency task force on financing for development. So the, so the effort here is to try to bring all these various instruments uh, that, trying, that are attempting to address sustainable and uh, resilient infrastructure and to provide that know-how into it. Next slide, please. Um, the principles have been developed to address the fact that we currently lack common understanding for, um, as I said, for, uh, of what resilient infrastructure means. Uh, we have come to the understanding and conclusion a year back or so that there is currently no clear benchmarks of how to achieve resilient infrastructure. Now, what UNDR has undertaken, the RIS has undertaken this work in developing the principles is to help member states, stakeholders, and investors but to better understand and clarify the concept. Coordination at international level can lead to common benchmarks, which can be adapted to national and local levels. But as a first step, we need a clear understanding around existing infrastructure systems related to their performance, exposure, current regulatory environments, challenges, barriers, as well as resilience entry points. The current approach to infrastructure planning, financing, design, development, including operations, do not fully take into account either the interdependent nature of infrastructure services or the complex nature of risk and the cascading impacts. What we are calling for that is that we need a think resilience approach that would address these concerns. The principles are also intended to help accelerate the implementation of both the Sandai framework and SDGs. They are intended for use at any level of government, institutions, donors, investors, designers, contractors, service providers, international organizations, and public stakeholders. Next slide, please. What, what, what you see here is basically something that I have already touched upon is that you know, we are looking at various actors and, in, and the role that various actors are going to play around these principles in the deployment of it. I'm not going to go into the details of this because this is, this is, this is just to signify the role of uh, shared accountability and responsibility around infrastructure resilience. Next slide, please. Now, in, in these, through these uh, principles, we are also from, uh, bringing on the table a concept of what's called the net resilience game and the need for looking into systemic resilience. Now, systemic resilience arises dynamically when the national infrastructure is organized in such a way that it can provide agreed critical services despite hazards and other interruptions. Now, the purpose of proposing a term such as net resilience gain, which is not very common, is to 
build a complementarity around net uh, zero approach. Uh, while net zero approach and initiatives are predominantly geared towards carbon uh, reduction, carbon uh, emission mitigations, the point of time that we are in is that you know, we cannot just wait for that to happen. The increasingly infrastructure is at stress and uh, is, is getting disrupted. So we need to bring the entire approach of building resilience at this point of time. Uh, and the intent of net resilience approach is to provide that long-term collaborative commitment to both to avoid systemic resilience loss and to enhance systemic resilience. Next slide, please. So here are the six principles. Um, these are six interconnected principles. Um, one of them is continuously learning. The other one is proactively protected. The third is intergovernment, uh, environmentally integrated. The fourth is socially engaged. The fifth is shared responsibility. And the uh, last one is adaptively transforming. Uh, we have gone through a uh, year long exercise of getting feedback and consultations, including uh, getting feedback from more than 110 governments through the global consultation exercises. Uh, these feedback have already gone into the design of the final, prin final uh, principles, which would be coming out soon at the global platform in Bali. Um, the next step from here would be to take these principles to countries for implementation and to help not just member state, but also institutional investors and various other actors in in reorienting the financial flows around infrastructure uh, processes and investments. Um, next slide, please. And I think I'll be done with that. I mentioned about the release of the principles. Um, I'm taking this opportunity also on behalf of my other colleagues who are uh, joining in the panel today, uh, particularly Nestor, who, um, whose OECD is also involved in this side event. And if anybody in the room virtually, um, but also physically is at the Bali conference, uh, please, uh, please feel free to come by the session and uh, get to know a bit more on the principle. I'll stop with that. And um, uh, thank you, Mona, again. Thank you, Abhilash. A um, couple of things uh, that stood out for me. One, the process that you followed uh, for, solicited fee for soliciting feedback from agencies and stakeholders across the world for uh, this work. And uh, two more things that stood out for me. One was your mention of resilience as a core value. Mm. I think that is something that we must take forward as a large community. And the other, of course, is the think resilience approach. The net resilience gain definitely is a concept for sure, but philosophically, you know, the think resilience approach and the resilience as a core value, I think this must inform uh, our work as we move forward. So thank you very much, Abhilash, and congratulations for this beautiful piece of work that you and your colleagues have put together. Um, you mentioned Nestor, and I'll take this opportunity to turn to him now. So Nestor Alfonso is a well-recognized expert in disaster risk management. He currently serves as a senior advisor on risk governance uh, for the OECD within the Public Governance Directorate. Nesta, may I request you to present your thoughts on how these principles can be applied by national governments, each having their own unique risk context, the exposure to hazards, types of infrastructure, social issues, demographic issues, everything else packed in there. And uh, Abhilash did mention your involvement in the, uh, um, you know, the effort of developing those principles. So we'd like to hear from you, how can national governments take this entire effort forward? Over to you, Nesta. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's my great pleasure to, to be with you today. And, and as, you, as you said, the collective effort to build the principles has been a, a beautiful journey. I think from, from our perspective at the OECD, we have been trying to get to grips with how, how to help governments, not just our members, but also kind of uh, partner partner countries and, and, and countries with which we have cooperation agreements and kind of try and understand how to best uh, address the issue of governance of critical infrastructure resilience. And I think this is where, where we're coming from in terms of how national governments can leverage their public policy design, their governance arrangements to help pave the way for the principles. In that sense, I think 
we we think it's important and and we've developed this kind of policy toolkit to help government think about this uh and and you would find that it's it's kind of not surprising that one of the core elements of this is is kind of shared understanding of of the challenge and this is precisely what the principles are trying to do if if you are to share responsibility one of the essential elements of governance is to be able to have a common vision of what it is that you're trying to build resilience to so being able to share information about the risk exposures and and the outputs of all the efforts that the governments do to understand the risks to the countries with those uh both building infrastructure but also running infrastructure using infrastructure to be able to have that common vision of resilience is was one of the key things that you have to have but also um, it's really important to understand that national governments are not sort of uh, in isolation they 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 have to make partnerships they have to work in conjunction with uh, others uh, disasters respect no boundaries and being able to understand and expand on the transboundary dimension of the infrastructure resilience challenge is really, really important. And then finally is breaking up, breaking down your own boundaries within government. So being able to have a truly whole of government approach that helps pave the way for a whole of society approach by going beyond the administrative boundaries of your different ministries of your different agencies to actually have a common vision of what it is that you're trying to achieve with infrastructure resilience, how you're going to hold each other accountable, how the different uh, elements, uh, legislative, uh, the executive, can actually hold each other to account when it comes to delivering on infrastructure resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Nesta. Very interesting points there, and uh, maybe we can, you know, touch base separately on the policy toolkit, unless you want to take a minute to expand on that a little bit uh, here. Would you like to do that, Nesta, the policy toolkit that you were mentioning? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Uh, so, so the policy toolkit was developed in, in 2019, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an open uh, toolkit. It's, it's available for anyone that's interested. It's, you don't have to be a member of the OECD to use it. Uh, and, and since then, we've been uh, sort of doing a series of, of data collections with, with, with states so that you can actually see how your country is doing against what other countries are doing. And we're just in the process of, of collecting a whole host of information about it, about it, its implementation with our member states as part of the review of the critical governance of critical risks recommendation uh, but I think we're going to talk in a bit more detail in the uh, side event of the global platform. So, so I do commend you to come and and listen to kind of how not just the the policy toolkit that we've developed, but also other initiatives uh, on this partnership that's developed the global principles on infrastructure resilience, uh, how it all fits together and how it kind of really helps put meat on the bones of kind of how do we tackle this challenge? Absolutely. So I look forward to it. Um, you also mentioned about partnerships across borders. You, you use the word boundaries. I'm morphing it slightly to borders across borders of disciplines and across borders of mandates, not only geographical borders. So thank you so much for uh, highlighting that point. And uh, that's very well taken. I will now turn to our panelist who represents the voice of financiers and investors mm -hmm. on this panel. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Shiva Makotoko. She is Deputy Chief Executive Officer of RBN Fund Managers, a registered impact fund manager and advisor. She was Special Technical Advisor on Municipal Finance and Infrastructure Financing to the National Department of Cooperative Governance. Shiva, we are curious to understand from you uh, your experiences on how, or your perspective perhaps, on how these principles that Abhilash was just talking about, they may be applied by public and private sector investors. Over to you, Shiva. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I think um, 
it's 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 common cause that uh, we need to standardize and and establish stand, uh, uh, benchmarks that uh, both from the public and private sector that help us to not only test the concepts that we bring to help drive development and inclusive development in a sustainable way, but also to hold those who are in leadership accountable for, for, for those, those standards and benchmarks. So from, from a public sector perspective, I think one of the most um, incredible aspects about these principles is the fact that you can begin to design from your the point that you define your projects in the in in your in infrastructure planning you can begin to address resilience within the context of not only planning but right through the value chain to the point of investments and 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 really build into your your infrastructure build the components of, of resilience right across the value chain, project preparation to how you take the, the, the program or portfolio of projects to, to market. The, we, have, we have had discussions around how you ensure that you, you design these projects in a manner that by the time you get to investors, there is no question around their sustainability because more and more investors are beginning to demand that most of the projects that they want to be uh, financing or investing in have to really address issues of sustainability and, and, and resilience. So in, in what we are doing in South Africa, for instance, we are testing with uh, the eight metropolitan municipalities how on the strength of existing infrastructure programs that are 20, 30 year uh, with the 2030 year horizon, how you can begin to in, embed resilience within, within their infrastructure as, as part of a program we are working on with the World Bank. On the investor side, I think one of the things that we have been, uh, we are taking to market in, in the way that we build not just a broader context of resilience, but also a climate adaptation alongside that is how you, during planning, implementation and operation of projects and in the way that you identify the project criteria and build investment case to ensure that you are competitive. It's, 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 it's again, I, I suggest that there is a concern around how the investment community, the, the, there's been quite a number of reports that suggest that there is a lot of mis-selling and a lot of uh, greenwashing that I think principles like this begin to help us come to a common language to be able to disclose the same kind of data and information and you are able to compare and actually help build the kind of resilience that doesn't only help governments and investors but empowers communities to be able to say in a more transparent and a clear defined framework how to drive uh, the objectives around sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Uh, two things that stood out for me. One is, you know, even as a financer, um, even as a financer, uh, you do stress, you did stress on the whole aspect of inclusive development. That to me stood out as uh, something that's desirable across the board, you know, no matter where we sit in, in the constellation, so to speak. And uh, you also mentioned this whole dimension of mis-selling and greenwashing mm. and the need to bring in transparency and accountability uh, in our work. And uh, so thank you so much for flagging these very critical points. In the meantime, we had an audience question that is actually linked to where I wanted to move with Dr. Roth. And that was around standards. So one of our uh, participants who's joined virtually is talking about standards uh, being static in their approach. So, and I was also very curious to understand from you, Dr. Roth, as to where do you see the role of standards in promoting DRI, static, dynamic, evolving? How do we sort of navigate 
this requirement from a context that is evolving on its own, yeah. you know, the, the disaster yeah. and climate risk uh, yeah. uh, context. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah. So um, I think we have to unpack this a little bit, right? Because obviously we have standards uh, for organizational performance. So organization management, quality management standards, um, knowledge management standards, ISO 3041, and they follow principles, <clears throat> right? They don't um, impose how you are supposed to implement these standards in your organization, but they're very clear what kind of structures have to be in place and that you have to be clear about what goals you want to achieve. So I think these kind of approaches help really to contextualize, contextualize what um, standards for resilience could mean can, at, at the country context level and sector level. So I think what we are increasingly seeing, it's more about how we are building capacity to think about standards and achieving certain performances in country context, rather than imposing general standards everywhere in all countries and, and you know, global centers then cannot be implemented um, and cannot be reinforced. Um, so this is in a way what we are talking about when we speak about adaptive standards. I give an example from the health sector, right, where we have standards. I come from the health sector originally. We have standards how to go about certain disease, you know, treatment pathways, and we have standards what kind of medicine we would give. But in some countries, this medicine is not available, or they're not even available in the dosages, you know, that we would give. COVID was one example. Steroid wasn't available in most developing countries in the dosage that were recommended by WHO. So you have to adapt but you would still follow the same kind of principles of the standards that are being proposed. Of that, that requires, of course, critical understanding and very good, <laughs> very good understanding of what we want to achieve with these standards, right? Um, so uh, at the same time, maybe what is also interesting is how we consider the human factors of applying these standards, all right? Because I think that's where we have to be very conscious. Uh, number one, humans have optimism bias. We always think it's not going to be as bad as it as it might be. We always uh, we have a planning bias. We can't plan very well ahead. Um, we have a, a risk bias. We can't assess risk very well. And we have a present bias. So we can't think about the future very well. All these biases limit our understanding <laughs> to actually think about resilient standards. So I think the question is, how do we you know, manage behavioral science, bring this in, in these standard conversations will be very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Roth beautifully um, you know, articulated for us. So you did mention about the need to contextualize to local context, uh, adapt to an evolving need context. And therefore, you know, the, the question that we had from uh, one of our participants around standards being static or dynamic. So I think you are pointing out to the need to make the entire uh, standard setting system, if I were to call it that, more dynamic and responsive to the local context and to the needs uh, yeah. you know that that are rapidly evolving yeah. within that local context and, and maybe one point there that Please. means for the global community also instead of wasting or spending a lot of time and money on these global conversations where experts come together let's invest in building capacity in countries i think that's a very good investment right where you actually build capacity how to think about standards and how to implement them in context Absolutely. So it's a capacities. And of course, you know, the, the thing that you were mentioning about biases, you know, the blindfolds that yes. we have on us. Yes. We need to be mindful and remove them very consciously and then move forward objectively. Thank you very much for that intervention, uh, Dr. Roth. Let me now turn to Dr. Cassidy Johnson, back to the UK. Um, Dr. Johnson, we are very curious to understand from you, you know, how do you see all of this fitting with the academic community? You know, how, how can academia take this work forward, contribute to it, and benefit from this effort? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been teaching um, on uh, disaster risk reduction for about uh, 15 years now and doing research in that area. And I think uh, bringing in the uh, idea of disaster resilient infrastructure, I think, gives um, a, a sort of uh, different look on this issue, and I think is something that that academia can can embrace and do a lot of uh, interesting things on. I mean, I think I think there's two aspects. I mean, one is to do with research and developing research uh, projects with 
with partners, uh, with uh, different countries, as, as Susan was talking about, to uh, build capacity there. Um, so I think that's one element. But I want to focus a little bit more on the education element uh, in my comments here. Um, I think that, for example, in my department, um, I, we train over 200 uh, master's students every year and these students go in to work uh, in all kinds of organizations, whether it's in the private sector, uh, in uh, international organizations, working for national governments. Um, I really come across students that have come through my department in sort of all areas of professional life. And I think there's a real opportunity here to be talking to students who are doing, whether it's undergraduate or postgraduate studies, um, about what are these concepts of resilience and resilient infrastructure. Um, for example, in, the te in teaching, uh, when I teach about disaster risk reduction, in cities, we spend a lot of time in the beginning of the uh, module talking about what is a disaster, what are the different meanings of disasters, um, how disasters are socially constructed, what is vulnerability, um, why are people vulnerable, who is more vulnerable, and particularly looking at poverty issues, um, un understanding the concept of resilience and how uh, and even the co-option of resilience and how this is sometimes uh, can be you know, negative in terms of social justice. So we, un we introduce students to ways of reading these things. And I think this is, uh, this is probably a very, very key thing to be able to have people have a critical understanding of what is uh, resilience, what is resilient infrastructure that they can put into their practice when they go into the professional world. Um, I've been working with uh, CDRI recently uh, and um, the Indian Institute for Human Settlements working with uh, Indian higher education institutes to try to think about what would be a uh, teaching, what would be a module or a program on disaster resilient infrastructure. Um, so we've been thinking through that and I think the idea of the meaning of concepts is really important, especially when you're talking about interdisciplinary teaching because people have to be on the same page about uh, what what is, um, for example, uh, even what is infrastructure? Um, because we're we talking about physical infrastructure, we're talking about social infrastructure, are we talking about critical infrastructure, are we talking about basic services? Because so many people in cities uh, are not even serviced by infrastructure. So are we talking about the resilience of infrastructure or are we talking about how infrastructure can make people more resilient and everyone in cities more resilient? So I think, uh, one, the concepts are very important in higher education, um, but also I think higher education has a huge role to play in, in bringing this issue of disaster resilient infrastructure uh, into professional practice as we go forward. Thank you, Cassidy. Thank you for also pointing us to your ongoing work with the Indian Institute of Human Settlements uh, with the support of the British Council and the FCDO at developing uh, you know, a set of core curricula on different aspects of disaster resilient infrastructure for the academic community in India and in the UK. So it's a very interesting project that's uh, taking shape. Thank you for pointing us to that. And from you, Cassidy, I have picked another uh, concept for our lexicon work, which is about co-option of resilience. You know, we'd like to unpack this with you as, uh, you know, we meet again on the project itself. So thank you very much for that. Building the momentum on the role of different stakeholders and, you know, what, what uh, their stakes can be in this process. I want to now turn to Shiva uh, and we'd like to hear from you on the synergy uh, that's possible with the private sector in this space, please. Over to you, Shiva. Uh, th thank you very much again. I think uh, perhaps just to share that in South Africa, we have just uh, launched the green taxonomy, which is a component of the broader financing a sustainable economy strategy of the country. And saying that to emphasize that uh, work of this nature is as good as it is able to be to, to be undergathered within the broader development framework. So if we are able to take uh, the principles as well as uh, the standards and, and all the knowledge that, that arises out of the work, that this, this incredible work that is being done, and align it within 
what exists already in the different countries. So from an invest, investor perspective, and, and, and I'm, I'm referring to South Africa and, and, and this, this, this taxonomy launch that, that uh, as a way of suggesting to, 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 to colleagues that the idea of addressing sustainable finance from an investment perspective it's no longer just an idea. We, it's, 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 there, there has been a process in South Africa, for instance, where there has been very intense consultation. There are, there are processes and documents and information and guidelines and standards that are being uh, adapted mainly from the EU work that, that, that has been done in this area. And if we were able to take out of this uh, and, and, are ab and we, are able to integrate and align most of this work into what is happening in the different countries in a way that enforces collaboration between private sector, private sector between uh, government and between communities. I think there's, there's, a greater, there's a greater win. I think one of the good things that uh, arises out of this work is equally that you can use it can be used by lenders, it can be used by investors and owners of, of, of assets. It, it can cut across, it, it cuts across different, different areas and it can be used for different investments. So when you, when you build resilience uh, from an infrastructure development perspective, you, you are actually creating a much broader base around which uh, different kinds of investments and different uses of 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 uh, investments can be can be applied and and recognizing uh, with with the with the direct and enabling environment that the principles are supported by activities so very specific activities that align to the principles that you can you are not seeking to replace ESG you are not seeking to replace investment policies uh, or strategies but you are building into them in a way that helps to support a much more resilient uh, uh, infrastructure development uh, ecosystem that makes it attractive for investors to come on board. I think it's going to be very important that there is alignment and within the alignment it recognizes what exists, what has been done and where the gaps are and how you build into what exists this emerging, emerging uh, knowledge around a uh, resilient infrastructure. Thank you, Shiva. That was bang on. I mean, you know, that is um, actually resonating the spirit of how we work and how, you know, we can take things forward. You mentioned uh, alignment and recognition of what exists and what can be built upon. So thank you very much for that. And, you know, wearing my CDRI hat, we are hungry for New knowledge, you talked about the green taxonomy, something that uh, we must refer to and, you know, see how we can sort of build on that uh, and complement that. Thank you very much uh, again, Shiva. We have an audience question for Abhilash, and I think we should take that first. The question to you, Abhilash, from uh, one of our participants is how to decide on the degree of resilience in infrastructure. Can safe failure of infrastructure be considered in extreme cases? Abhilash, would you like to take that question? Sure, sure. Ma, ma, thanks for that question. Um, you know, when you, when you look at the principles, uh, there is particularly a, one of the principles which refers to safe to fail. Uh, and that's because we very clearly have to acknowledge and understand that infrastructure will, the existing infrastructure or the current stock that we have, it will reach a break point. And there would be instances where infrastructure will definitely fail. That does not mean that infrastructure is not resilient. Um, that does not mean that there was something wrong absolutely with that uh, asset category. As long as that infrastructure is safe to fail, that it does not create further harm to what the operations of that asset was, or it has the ability to bounce back or you know, come back to its original operative scenario, 
it should be acceptable and there is also this concept within resilience on what is uh, what is an acceptable level of resilience there would be such uh, i mean okay let's take the example of covid-19 right in certain countries and certain uh, scenarios we have seen uh, the health infrastructure system coming to a situation of near failure now that's one way of looking at it because there was multiple stress factors going on top of it but at the same time the energy supply to the health health departments or the supply industry behind it or the value chain industry behind it was still functioning so there was an acceptable level of non or non operation of the health assets in in those cases and that should be taken into account and the principles do that and and the principles have taken those things into board now how far the stretch is uh, we have to also look at Uh, when we look at the transition risks coming in, uh, are the new investments that going into infrastructure taking the flexibility and the redundancy of infrastructure uh, systems in it or not? Um, we cannot have infrastructure systems or infrastructure asset systems which are very hard. They need to be flexible in the process of design, investment, but also operation and maintenance around it. thank you abhilash that was um, bang on i think you know you've you've covered the different dimensions of the resilience perspective uh, you know in in various uh, in the way they manifest to us across the life cycle uh, of any infrastructure system and going back to the point that cassidy was also making earlier about you know we are just not focusing on assets we are looking at a systemic approach and sometimes a system of systems approach looking at how interdependencies between sectors can support a particular asset component and a system to function uh, you know at least at the minimum capacity that's required for uh, you know continued services so thank you very much for that i want to request a final input from nestor on where do you see this going with policy makers you know in terms of fostering a more supportive policy environment for dri thank you um th- thank thank you for the question i think and and it's it's really nice to to come in just after uh what i was saying and after what kasdi was saying and shiva because i think as a policy maker you you you're normal and 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 I'm a policy maker myself uh before the OECD I was working in national government I was working for the British uh government I'm a, a long term civil servant and and I think I got the civil servant chip in my head to kind of 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 in in the best possible way in in the kind of public service vocation right and and as a public servant you you are responsible for 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 being the guarantor of two things one is is delivering sort of uh delivering value for money so 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 being able to cuz as as a state we constantly putting our hands in everyone's pockets taking money out and and we need to be really responsible of how we spend that money and and being able to spend that money in a way that delivers the best possible combination of adaptability flexibility but also continuity of service particularly for those most vulnerable in society i think it's absolutely essential as a kind of policy challenge and and it's at the core of what a public servant needs to be thinking about when designing policies and the other thing is you are also the guarantor as a public servant of something super fragile which is trust and it's the trust that the public is a trust that uh those that have put you in 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 the position of power that is able to set the rules for the game they 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 have placed on you a trust that you cannot betray and you have to constantly be thinking about measures to build on that trust so that all the different partners in society can interact in a positive way with government the more they trust government the more they're going to be able to comply with policy uh, requirements new changes we've seen it very strongly with covid those states where the, there was the biggest trust actually were the states that had the highest compliance and the lowest uh, fatality rates and it's it's kind of that virtuous cycle of trust and being able to preserve the trust and in 
foster the trust that will actually help us implement those really, really tough choices when it comes to delivering resilient infrastructure. Thank you, Nestor. That was so beautifully put together. And uh, to me, that builds upon what Shiva was earlier saying. So the need for transparency and accountability, but that has to rest on a sense of responsibility from the guarantors point of view and also this effort to build trust and remain in that space with the people that you're trying to serve there. So thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Nesta. Very, very uh, important and beautifully put uh, uh, intervention there. We're moving towards the end of the session. We can carry on. This is a very, very interesting topic of discussion. Uh, I want to turn to Susan, who's here in the studio with us to you know, share with us, what are you taking away uh, home from this session? Yeah, I think very interesting. Uh, I take away three things. Number one, we have to consider the human factor in developing these standards. And we have to see the opportunity to build trust and common understanding, common ground with these standards. And we need that specifically to engage with the private sector. Um, and the private sector will benefit from these standards because you can actually develop risk products and insurance products around it, which links very well with a conversation about, say, failure. If we have infrastructure that follows standards and that, that is in short, we would probably not also say failure. If we consider the human factor, we can then also think better about unintended consequences of people of fa from failure. I think mean, we covered all of this very well. Um, one point maybe which we should discuss in another session <laughs> is the question of reinforcement, right? I mean, we can have beautiful standards and we have beautiful uh, implementation mechanisms, but if we don't have reinforcement that is, um, if we don't have reinforcement that is actually trusted, then um, then we have a failure there too, and that's not a safe failure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Susan. That's um, very nicely summed up. Makes my task easier. Thank you. So to, to close the session today, we have a small illustration to share with you all. Can we have that up on screen, please? So as a young student of architecture, uh, we were taught to look at the same thing from different vantage points. And uh, no, the other one, please. Actually, stay with that. No, move forward. Next one, please. Yeah, this is the one I wanted. So if you look at it closely, <laughs> This is how the customer explained what they wanted. The project leader understood it differently, how the analyst designed it, the programmer wrote it. And finally, just look at what the customer was built at the bottom. And what the customer actually needed was at the far right bottom uh, you know, illustration there. So you know the, the, the feeling at CDRI on this whole aspect is that the only way forward is together. You know, we cannot continue to exist in our silos of disciplines and organizations and mandates. We have to have, um, you know, a common melting pot where our thoughts and our perspectives come together to build a common understanding. Therefore, you know, what we, we keep reminding ourselves internally is the only way forward is together. And to move forward together, we do need a shared understanding of what is the lay of the land. Uh, what are the goals and aspirations that we're all seeking? Let's understand them and share that understanding. And this will only reinforce the synergies and complementarities uh, this work requires so badly between disciplines, between organizations, between specialists and non-specialists in the DRI field. With that, we come to the end of this session. Thank you very much. I'd like to express our deep appreciation for all the panelists who've joined uh, you know, at all sorts of odd hours, depending on where you are located around the globe. Thank you very much for taking the time and uh, joining us this morning. Um, I particularly want to acknowledge the UNDRR team, Avilash himself and his colleagues, Helen and Alex, for their support with this session. And thanks very much to all our audience who are here in the studio with us and those who have joined virtually. Thanks very much indeed. We'll see you in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cassidy, Shiva.